welcome everyone to Sri Radha Gopinath Sunday Festival. Thank you for being here. There are many festivities for many purposes in many places that are celebrated in many, many ways. On the path of pure bhakti, our festival is every opportunity to come together to share our love for Krishna with each other and with the world. It is a celebration of the heart, celebration of the Atma, the eternal soul. This beautiful drama that was just performed is the story of a celebration. How many enjoyed the drama? But the children who performed it, I believe, enjoyed giving it to you hundreds of times more than you enjoyed receiving. This is what makes a festival of bhakti where our joy is in giving. There is a very common saying, in giving we receive. This is a universal principle. The evolution of human consciousness is going from the need to get things to the joy of giving. And the more of a difference we make in someone's life when we give, the greater the joy. And the greatest problem in this world, according to the Gita, Janmamrityu Jarabhyadi Dukkha Dosa Nudarshana, birth, old age, disease, and death. Because ultimately, everyone is looking for happiness. Everyone is trying to avoid pain. But there really is no stable material arrangement to fulfill that purpose. Dukalayam ashashvatam. Because everything in this world is changing. Things not only could happen, but will happen either due to some mistake we made or some past karma we have done that may even be beyond our control. To feed poor people is to give. That's a certain level of charity. It's a certain state of consciousness in giving. To hospitalize sick people, to give them medical treatment. This is also sattva guna. It's to help a person in a goodness. Charity in the mode of ignorance is to give a person the wrong thing. It's like someone in the street says, please give me cigarette. So if you give them a cigarette, it's not such a pious thing to do. It's probably, seems more pious than if you smoked it yourself. (laughs) But actually, you're just giving that person an opportunity to incriminate him or herself in suffering. When we give in charity... 
the wrong thing, something that's actually not good for a person, or even something that, that's, according to the person, they're going to misuse it in the wrong way. That's charity and tamaguna. Charity and rajaguna is we give something good, but we actually do it because of what we can get materially in return. I will become famous. I will get a reputation as being someone charitable. I will get recognition, adoration, or I may even get extra profits. Because if I give in charity, my, give, my, my company gives in charity and people hear about it, they'll buy from my company. So it's an investment. Yes, charity is an investment. That's Rajaguna in the mode of passion. To actually give something for the welfare of someone without anything expected in return is in the mode of goodness. But still we see it's not that because we have lots of food and we have good hospitalization and we have some prestige, it doesn't necessarily make us happy. We see as many people with all of those things who are suffering as people who don't have those things. They're just different varieties of suffering. So to the extent we really care, we really want to do good for people, that's to the extent we're really giving. Because we are the Atma, we are the soul. We are not our bodies or mind. We are in our bodies and minds. So to help a person's body, to help a person's mind in a genuine way, through encouragement, through different types of um, ways, finding peace, inspiration, positive thinking, even in difficult situations, ways of overwhelm, overcoming stress, this is all in the mode of goodness if it's done with a genuine concern. But what have we given to the soul, the real person? What can actually help a person transcend suffering forever? Go beyond birth, beyond death, to see their relatives and their loved ones according to their spiritual nature. Rich or poor, your family members will die. That's painful. What have we given people to understand the spiritual identity of their family members? They are part of God. They are beyond birth and beyond death. And their soul may have gone away from this particular residence of the body but we could still do something wonderful for them. Through our devotion, through our love for Krishna, we could liberate the souls of countless generations of our relatives. What to speak of those who are with us now and what to speak of other people. So Sanatan Dharma is to understand the treasures of who we really are and giving that same treasure to others. <clears throat> because we can't give so much unless we have something to give. <clears throat> Just like if a person is... I remember when I was a beggar wandering in the Himalayas and some lepers came to me and they were begging for money. And I really wanted to give them some money because they were really suffering. But I didn't have even one paisa. So what could I give them? They were starving. They were freezing. They were homeless. They were asking for help. What could I give? So if you don't have something, what can you give? <clears throat> so our sadhana, our satsang, our sadhachar, these spiritual practices actually Connect us to the real wealth of spiritual joy of Krishna's grace. 
Radha's grace. That is actually our real wealth. And to the degree we access that, to that degree we can give that. Bharata bhumite hoila manusya janmasha. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, all people from India, you have been given the greatest wealth of this great culture of bhakti. Sarapara upakar. The greatest welfare work is to give the knowledge that the soul is eternal. That the soul is part of God and the soul could be connected to God and realize the joy of that relationship forever. And especially in this age of Kali, that is possible, accessible for everyone through the chanting of the holy name. My class went over time in the morning and then I had meetings all the way till one o'clock and then I had some other things and I wondered, what am I going to speak about? And then I heard the drama, so that gave me something to speak about. <laughs> Ravana, he's a good example. <laughs> we could learn from the from every type of person. But the, the problem is what we learn from them. <laughs> <laughs> we could learn how to be the worst people in the world from Ravana, and we could learn not to be like him. And that's kind of the situation with everyone we meet. We could learn, you know, once we, un- once we have a foundation of what's really valuable in life, then in every situation we could learn lessons. <laughs> what lesson are we supposed to learn from you? <laughs> what was that? Radio. Radio. Oh, radio. Okay. At least it wasn't a cell phone. <laughs> So, technology has its great values, but it also could create many distractions. So, Ravana, what was his wealth? In India, you know, it's traditional that people keep gold. Yes? I don't know so much. (laughs) But some, you know, sometimes when a girl gets married... They get so much gold, and then they keep it, and they keep their mother's gold and their grandmother's gold and so much gold. (laughs) Even my own, just, just recently, my niece came to my father's 90th birthday, and my father gave my niece on his 90, because to, in giving we receive. You know, people were saying happy birthday and everything. But he gave my niece my mother's gold earrings. She was very happy. <laughs> but he was even more happy. And my mother, I'm sure she was the most happy. <laughs> So even in America, this tradition of gold is something very nice. Because, you know, dollars, they come and go. But gold is something that can generation after generation after generation, you know, be within the family. So Ravana, he had so much gold. As far as my study of world history, I think he had the most gold of anybody that ever lived. He built his whole city out of gold. Yes, incredible. There were palaces made out of gold, inside and out. Altars made out of gold. He had an airplane. His airplane was made out of gold. 
And it wasn't like these airplanes. You know, whatever airlines you choose. (laughs) They're more or less all the same. The same manufacturers make the airplanes for everybody. And, you know, then they just do a little more or a little less service in it. Rearrange it. But the Pushpavan, that airplane had beautiful parks, gardens, lakes, palaces, beautiful palace rooms and beds, concert halls, and thousands of people. And nobody has to buckle (laughs) seatbelts. No turbulence. And they can go whatever planet they want. He was a wealthy man, but he wasn't happy. He was always in anxiety. He was always in fear that somebody was going to try to take away all that he worked so hard to get. And he worked hard. You think you work hard for years. He spent thousands and thousands of years in tapasya, fasting, in freezing cold places. Yes? In order to get the powers that he needed. And then he had to fight wars with Indra and so many others. and Even his own brother, Kuvera. So he was, he thought he was a self-made man, as they say. But he was always in anxiety. Because when you're attached to something, you see the world through your own image, and you think, if, if I like this so much, that means so many other people might like it. So, so many people want to have it. And he had so many lovely ladies that he attracted by his power, his influence, his force, whatever. His wife, Mandodari, his principal queen, was absolutely incredible, beautiful. He had everything. He had power. He had wealth. He had sensual enjoyment. He was always afraid and always wanting something more. To such an extent that even against the, the good advice of Maricha and Vibhishan and Mandodari, he went and kidnapped Sita the wife of Ram. And he was obsessed. Nothing else matters to me if I can't get you. Such a world. Vibhishan lived right there in Sri Lanka. Can you imagine? Such worldly beauty, but so much violence and arrogance That was the standard of greatness, being totally arrogant, envious, manipulative, and physically and mentally powerful. And everyone was training to get those things, and he had such an army. When Hanumanji was searching for Sita, He jumped over the Indian Ocean and he took a little form and was just looking around because he wanted to report to Ram exactly what Sri Lanka was like. And while people were having all sorts of obscene enjoyments that swamis don't talk about, and so much intoxication and so much... um, just, they think it's happiness. But when Hanuman saw it, it was terrible. It was, he felt so sad. Yanisha Saravabhutana. What's night for some people is day for another. What was that? What was happiness for Ravana's people? Hanuman was seeing with absolute pity. 
And in order to have that vision, we need good, strong satsang. Otherwise, we could be carried away. When, when, a, when, a, when a sadhu or a devotee sees people enjoying intoxication and enjoying all sorts of you know, sensual relationships, the people think, we are enjoying, we are great. And a devotee looks... On one level, it's disgusting how they're wasting their human life for these fleeting pleasures. On another level, these poor... We should pity them. That's the way a sadhu looks at people who are just... Eat, drink, and be merry. Life is meant for enjoyment, whatever form. But when those people see a sadhu... They think the same thing. They're wasting their life. (laughs) Look at what they're missing. Look at what I'm enjoying and they are missing. How could they possibly be happy without what I have? And they pity us. Sometimes. Sometimes I tell the story, when I became a devotee, I wrote to my mother and I signed it, your servant. (laughs) And she wrote back and said, why are you demeaning yourself? Why are you in such a safe state of low self-esteem? You are a great boy. You have, edu- you know, you have so much potential education. Why are you calling yourself a servant? She thought that this being a devotee was completely ruining my self-esteem. So I wrote a letter back to her, and I signed it, "The servant of your servant." <laughs> She never brought up the subject again. <laughs> Obviously, if she didn't want to hear the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. <laughs> but then when she came to India years later, she was crying in joy. She said, now I understand. There's nothing greater and more beautiful than being a servant. <laughs> Which is true. Nothing greater than being the servant of a servant of a servant. So although Vibhishan was living there in the worst possible environment, he was completely pious, unselfish, humble, generous, and was always, he and his wife were constantly worshipping Ram in their house. But he was so loving and kind to his brother, Ravana. Even, as we saw in this drama, Hanuman, when he was captured... By Ravana, Vibhishan said, you cannot kill him because he's a messenger. It's against our codes. So Ravana indirectly wanted to kill him. Light his tail on fire. He will suffer and ultimately die, but not directly. They had him tied up and they wrapped his tail up with huge quantities of flammable cloth and then soaked it in flammable oil and lit it. It was a massive fire. It wasn't like a little match or a candle. It was a massive fire, blazing. Hanuman saw this as an opportunity to serve. (laughs) This This is a great soul. He doesn't, we don't see why is this happening to me. Even apparent 
crises that are inconceivable. You can think that way. Why is this happening to me? And it's justified. But a higher consciousness, how can I serve? How could I serve in this situation? So Hanuman expanded himself, contracted himself, slipped out of the ropes, jumped to the roof, and then took his tail and touched it to the roof. (laughs) The palace went on fire. And then dovetailing his monkey propensities, he jumped to the next roof. (laughs) And he was just touching, touching, touching. This is a lesson on karma, too. That when you do harm to another, it's going to come back to you. The same fire that Ravana lit to cause Hanuman's suffering caused him the greatest suffering of his life. Yes? Wasn't a different fire. Same fire. Just like sometimes you go to places and they keep the same flame lit for so many years. Like in some countries, there's the tomb to the unknown soldiers of everybody who died in a certain war. And there's a certain flame that has been lit there since the war in honor of those people. Even if you go to Gambira, there's a little ghee lamp in the little corner of Lord Chaitanya's home that is said has been, that same fire has been going since the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I think at Gandhi's tomb there's a flame there too, something like that. I don't remember, but I've been to so many. But anyways, Ravana, it was his flame. He started the flame. And Hanuman, all right, you set me, you want your I'll share your flame. (laughs) You gave it to me, I'll share it. And the city was burning. Afterward, when Ram had his camp along with the monkey soldiers at the Vanaras and they were crossing the ocean before that, even before they crossed the ocean, when they were assembled on the shore near Rameshwaram, spies came to see and they came and told Ravan. And Vibhishan told him, just give Sita back. That's all. Just give Sita back. She does not belong to you. She belongs to Ram. Do you know how much courage that took to speak the truth to him? He said, if you do not give him back, her back. You will be destroyed. Your whole dynasty, your family, everything will be destroyed. Just give back Sita. Ravana became so angry, he literally rejected Vibhisha. If you were not my brother, I would kill you. I reject you. And then as we saw in the drama, Vibhishan, with two of his ministers, went across the ocean. They didn't even need a bridge. And he came to take shelter of Ram. First he was misunderstood. But Hanuman, Hanuman understood his heart. And with total faith in Hanuman's word, Ram accepted Vibhishan as his own servant. Now, even though Ravana was so cruel, he abused Vibhishan beyond human conception. His words pierced his heart. He scolded him, chastised him, blasphemed him, rejected him, exiled him. After the war, Ram had already coronated Vibhishan as the king. Ram told Vibhishan, you should perform the last rites for Ravana. Vibhishan said, how could I perform the last rites for him? If I perform the last rites in your behalf, 
you know, I'll give him liberation. Why should I do that for him? He was so cruel. He stole your wife. Because of him, so many have died. So many have suffered. What to speak of the abuse and the rejection. But Ram told Vipisha that we should never carry vengeance toward anyone. We hate the disease, but not the person who's diseased. Ravana's disease was his arrogance and his lust and his envy and his anger, his greed. But now there's no more disease. He's dead. (laughs) Now you could help liberate his soul. You should give that. And Vibhishan, with all his heart, believed in that. And with great love and devotion, Vibhishan forgave Ravana and performed the last rites. That was his greatness. In the Mahabharata, there's a very similar story. Vidura. He was so much like Vibhishan. And he went through so many of the same experiences. He was the younger brother, just like Vibhishan was younger brother of Ravana. Vidura was the younger brother of Dhritarashtra. And just like Ravana had his eldest son, Indrajit, who was constantly pushing his father to do the wrong things, although his father didn't need so much pushing. <laughs> Sritarashtra had Duryodhana. And Duryodhana did need a lot of pushing. And Duryodhana, I mean, Sritarashtra did. And Duryodhana was pushing and pushing. And in the same way, for year after year, Vidura, as the loving brother and friend of Dhritarashtra, just like Vibhishan was to Ravana, was always trying to tell him to do the right thing. But Ravana and Dhritarashtra, year after year, were doing the wrong thing. Vidura would tell Dhritarashtra, the kingdom is not yours. It belongs to the Pandavas, Yudhisthira. Give back what doesn't belong to you. That was Vidura. Vibhishan, Sita doesn't belong to you. Give back to Ram. Vidura understood the Pandavas to be great devotees of Krishna. And both of them, in great humiliation, left. Vidura, such terrible words spoken through Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra said nothing, therefore confirmed it. He left his kingdom, his family, left even his wife behind with nothing. Vibhishan did the same thing. And they both took shelter of Ram and Krishna. Vibhishan by joining the army, Vidura by going to the holy places. And interesting, Vibhishan came back to perform the last rites and liberate Ravana. And Vidura came back to Hastinapur, even after all the abuse, to actually preach to Dhritarashtra. And he gave him liberation. This emphatic principle of compassion and forgiveness seeing the disease but not hating the diseased is very much foundational to Vaishnav character. A doctor is positively concerned for the patient but will do anything possible to alleviate the disease. 
So Hanuman, who was the personification of this principle, he came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, as Murari Gupta, who happened to be a doctor, a medical person. And the Supreme Personality of Godhead loves to show unity in, ver- in variety. Grihetako, banitako, sadahari bolitako. Whether we're grihasta, whether we're sannyasi, brahmachari, the real thing is our devotion, how we're actually calling out God's names and living in a spirit of seva. So Marari Hanumanji was the ultimate brahmachari. Yes? For him, it was just Ram Seva. But he came as Sri Chaitanya's Leela as Marari Gupta, who was a Grihastha. He had a wife. And he was an Ayurvedic doctor, and an excellent Ayurvedic doctor. One time, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because he wanted to show the heart of his devotees. You see, we read so many teachings in Srimad Bhagavatam, we read so many teachings in the Gita, in the Upanishads, in the Vedas. The special feature about these books like Ramayana and Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, is the teachings come alive through the life of the great souls. Srimad Bhagavatam so many good teachings. It's the postgraduate study of Bhagavad Gita. When we see how the Pandavas lived, how Prahlad, Dhruva, Ambarish, Prachetas, Rantidev, when we see the quality of their lives and the choices they make, especially in conditions of great difficulty, from that example, we actually can understand the teachings. Because jnana vigyana triptatma, knowledge is only meant to be practiced. If we don't practice the knowledge, there's never realization. All knowledge is meant for transformation. It's not just to know. To know means absolutely nothing spiritually unless it transforms our heart, unless we apply that knowledge to the way we live. In the good times, in the hard times. We don't get arrogant when things are good. We don't get depressed when things are bad. We don't... We actually are always seeing every situation to humbly surrender to the Lord. So the Lord teaches through his devotees. Marari Gupta was called by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on the Satprahara Lila or the Mahaprakash. Lord Chaitanya was actually assuming his, his true eternal identity as the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, and giving benedictions to all his devotees. He was calling them up one by one and revealing the form that they loved. Now, Lord Chaitanya, to many of these of his servants, he didn't give them the understanding of who they were in previous incarnations. This is quite incredible. Marari Gupta is Hanuman himself, but in order to make the Leela very sweet and interesting, he didn't know he was Hanuman. He only thought he was Marari Gupta. But he loved Ram, just like Hanuman loved Ram. But he didn't know that was the Lord's Yoga Maya. So he called Marari up. And Marari stood and looked at the beautiful golden form of Goranga. 
and and right before his eyes, Lord Chaitanya's form changed. He became Ramchandra. His complexion became like the Durba grass. He was holding a magnificent bow. He had a quiver attached to his back with arrows. He was so beautiful. And to the left side of Ram, to the right side of Ram, was Lakshman. And to the left side was Sita. And Hanuman saw, even though we were just, he was right in the little courtyard of Srivas on the altar, he saw innumerable monkey soldiers all around Ram, Sita, and Lakshman. And they were all offering prayers and worship. And then he happened to look at himself and he saw that he had a tail. (laughs) He had the body of a monkey. He fell unconscious. And Lord Chaitanya, in the form of Ram, touched him with his hand and said, and said, wake up, wake up! Monkey, monkey! Don't you see? I am your beloved, worshipable object, Ram. For me, you gave your entire life to serve. I'm the ultimate object of your love. And look, here is Lakshman. For him, you lifted the Gandamadana mountain to save his life. And here is Sita, the ultimate object of your love and devotion. When you saw her in the Ashokvan of Ravana, you wept in love, a shoreless ocean of tears for her. Don't you remember? You don't remember, but I remember. And I am telling you now, you are Hanuman, my eternal associate. Marari Gupta, Everything then became clear to him. Lord Chaitanya, he said, ask from me any benediction. I will give you anything. Murari Gupta said, what could he ask for? He was having darshan of Ram, Sita, Lakshman, and all of his old friends. He said, I do not want to ask for anything. But if it pleases you, if it pleases you, my Lord, just give me one benediction. Allow me to always sing your names and glories. Allow me to take birth anywhere. If I remember you with love in all circumstances. Allow me to associate with your devotees, those who love you, birth after birth after birth. The only benediction I like is let me always remember you and sing your glories that you are my supreme, lovable Lord. And let me never forget that I am always your eternal servant. When Lord Chaitanya heard this, He said, I grant you your benediction. You will always remember me, always be in the association of my devotees, and you will always chant my holy names. (laughs) 
This is the bhakti of Hanuman. According to the great Vaishnava Acharyas, Ramanuja, Madhva, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Vishnu Swami, Nimbarka Acharya, Balabha Acharya, all of these, the, the Alwars, this was their very deepest conviction. that the highest revelation of love is in the spirit of being the servant of the servant of the servant. <clears throat> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was about to instruct Sri Sanatan Goswami in the innermost secrets of the highest realms of love of Goloka and all the various levels leading to that, his premise was Jivera Swarupoy Krishnara Nityadas. That the living being is eternally a servant of Krishna. Because in bhakti, the truest, highest, and purest sense of love is reciprocal. Hanuman doesn't want to become Ram. Could you imagine telling Hanuman, you can become Ram. He would probably utilize his club. <laughs> he wants to love Ram. He wants to serve Ram. And feeling Ram's love for him is infinitely so satisfying. You see, becoming the concept of of entering into the all-pervading Brahman is certainly a spiritual form of ecstasy because it's total peace. No birth, no death. It's just pure existence. And it's within the Lord's effulgence, so it's very ecstatic. But Ram, Krishna, the absolute supreme Rasa Bihari, the supreme lover, to feel his infinite love for us and to reciprocate by loving him and with gratitude and humility serving him. Rupa Goswami tells that the bliss of impersonal realization is like a drop compared to the limitless ocean of happiness as a loving servant. Because you see, when you're a loving servant, Krishna, Ram, reciprocates with his infinite love. It's the highest. We don't want anything for ourselves. Our pleasure is in Krishna's pleasure. Hanuman's only pleasure was in Ram and Sita's pleasure. And when you love Ram and Sita, you love everyone. When, Ra, when Hanuman came back from Sri Lanka and came to Kishkinda Kshetra, he went to Madhuban, which was the favorite fruit grove of Sugriva. Do you know that story? I think we're going there next Yatra in Kartik. <laughs> At least that was a thought. But thoughts become, like seeds become fruits, sometimes thoughts become realities. But Hampi, Kishkinda, there's a place called Maduban there. And that is a place where Sugriva had his most favorite fruit tree garden. And when Hanumanji came back from Sri Lanka and told all the monkeys about beating Sita and about his jumping around with his burning tail and everything else, they were so happy. They were celebrating. And they went into Maduban and they were jumping on the trees and eating all the fruits and Sugriva was furious. Yes. But then he was told, Hanuman just wants to make everyone happy. <laughs> When you, when you taste the fruit of love of God, you want to share it with everyone, everywhere. 
So Sugriva became happy too after some time. Morari Gupta Hanuman the ultimate pleasure is to give pleasure to the beloved think about the benediction I only want to sing sing your glories remember you and serve you when Ram smiles the pleasure the soul receives by giving pleasure to him is billions of times greater than liberation. One day in Puri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was telling the devotees about Hanuman's love. May I tell you? He said, I told Marari Gupta one day that why are you worshipping Ram? That's excellent. But even more excellent is worship of Krishna. Because Krishna is the fountainhead of all incarnations. The sweetness of the love that Krishna exchanges with the devotees is the most complete. He's Purna Brahman. And I'm a devotee of Krishna. And so many other people are devotees of Krishna. So please, worship Krishna. Chant the holy names of Krishna with us. And Murari Gupta said, yes, I will. But then the next day, Murari Gupta came to Sri Chaitanya. Mahaprabhu. And he said, all night, I tried to worship Krishna. But in my mind, I could only see Sri Ram. I tried to chant the name of Krishna, but my tongue could only taste the sweetness of Ramchandra's name. I have already given my head, I've given my life to Lord Ram, and it's impossible for me to take it back and give it to anyone else. Now the beautiful thing is Ram and Krishna are the same person. They're not different people. They're the same person who have appeared in different ways for their devotees. And Marari Gupta know that. He said, to please you is my life and soul, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But I cannot follow your instruction. So please, I ask your permission. Allow me to end my life. He was crying pathetically. He said, all night long I simply cried. Lord Chaitanya became joyful. He said, This is the glory of your love for Ram. He said, I simply wanted to test you to show the whole world the chastity and the faithfulness in your love for Sri Ram. He said, this is natural for you because you are Hanuman. Lord Chaitanya is Ram. Krishna is Ram. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, through Murari Gupta, wanted to take us beyond all the sectarian concepts. He is pleased with different devotees who have different moods of love. And it wasn't that the devotees were thinking less of Murari Gupta. He was one of the most exalted, worshipped among all the devotees. In fact one of the first biographies of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was the Chaitanya Charita. We learn from Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami that Lord Chaitanya's Navadvi pastimes as a child 
they were very carefully written in the biography and notes of Marari Gupta. And his later pastimes in Puri were carefully written by Swarup Damodar Goswami. So most of what we have of the life of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are from the diaries of Marari Gupta and Swarup Damodar Goswami. Marari Gupta is Hanuman. So much of the information of Lord Chaitanya's birth, his childhood pastimes, his Navadweep Sankirtan pastimes, so much of that, that great wealth, is coming from Hanuman. That is why Hanuman is in our temple giving us his blessings. The message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what was Hanuman's love? What was Marari Gupta's love for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Krishna with the love of Radha. But he was revealing himself to Marari as Ram. When Marari Gupta was thinking that Lord Chaitanya was going to leave the world, he didn't not he couldn't bear the thought of separation. And he actually had a plan to end his life. And Lord Chaitanya, he knows everything. He came to his house. He said, I heard you have a certain utensil. Please give me that utensil. Marabi said, Where did you hear this? I don't have such a utensil. Was there a utensil that he was going to use to end his life? Lord Chaitanya went right in his house and said, I know where it is. Picked it up. <laughs> said, you are more dear to me than my life. This is the love between them. And the love between Nityananda, Haridas Thakur, Kolavecha Sridhar, Murari Gupta, all of the Adwaitacharya, Gadadhar Pandit, all these devotees, they had one heart. Despite unity and diversity, despite all of their differences in so many ways, Adwaitacharya was the most worshipable leader of the Brahmin community. And Haridas Thakur was an untouchable outcast. But Adwaita and Haridas were the best of friends. And Adwaitacharya would publicly honor and worship Haridas Thakur and vice versa. Pundarik Vidyanidhi was an extremely wealthy man who lived with a lot of elegance. And Gadadhar Pandit was a very simple brahmachari who had no, no attraction for anything except bhajan and kirtan and seva. And yet they were like father and son. Gadadhar Pandit took initiation from Pundarika Vidyanidhi. Got Diksha Mantra from him. <laughs> in this way, so much in Mahaprabhu's Leela is contradictions in perfect harmony with each other because one purpose the ego divides us bhakti unites us thank you very much <laughs>